Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the opportunity to sit down and chat with amazing humans about their journeys with mental health. For this episode, I'm so happy to introduce Petra to the conversation. Welcome, Petra. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, So as I would do, brief introduction from my side, and then I'll get you to do a proper introduction, Petra, and let people know all about yourself, who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into the big conversation. So Petra and I know each other through, uh, no big surprise, social media, through LinkedIn, through following each other um, across that channel and social media, and listening to the conversation of mental health evolving through both of our experiences, I guess. Uh, I'm not going to steal too much of your thunder because you're going to tell us all about what you do, but uh, it's great when I see or hear people talking the same language of mental health, really passionate about the subject with a story that's just incredible and I know you're going to tell your story uh, shortly and say welcome Petra please do your introduction I hope that was okay from my side of course thank you and so nice to meet you and as you said just to watch each other's journey as we've developed over the last sort of months has just been inspiring it's been great to see your stuff Um, and so I'm privileged to to join you Uh, So who am I? Uh, Petra Velzebor. I run a a mental health consultancy, which has been growing, uh, I would say, astronomically over the past couple of years as alongside the mental health conversation. Right. So we've got a a, a team of five. We've got facilitators. We do run training uh, and also help businesses think about a sustainable approach to mental health. So having a mental health strategy, helping them put those foundation pieces in place so that the training can be as effective as possible. Uh, my background's actually youth work. So I started out with working with young offenders and kids that have been kicked out of school. And I think I was probably connected to that narrative of not having the right start in life, in air quotes. Um, I, I then trained as a psychotherapist. Uh, I've got a, I did a master's degree in psychodynamics of human development and sort of um, played with, you know, my career in lots of different ways. So I sort of moved into young people's mental health and then into working as in an EAP, actually, uh, an employee assistance program as their clinical director. And it didn't take long for me to realize that I really wanted to be somewhere that led by example, rather than, um, you know, maybe saying one thing, but on the inside doing something else. So that was the, that's the mission of the business. Amazing. So lots of pieces that we could delve into there. And I'm sure no doubt you'll get the chance to talk about some of those and how that all came about as well. So the big question, your journey with mental health, your story. So I'm just going to throw that over to you and I'm just going to let you go. So uh, looking forward to hearing this. Lovely. Um, I'm like, how much time have you got? But I'll try (laughs) and give you um, sort of the the overarching um, story, I guess, because I I started out in life a little bit different than many people. Um, I was born and raised in a religious cult called the Children of God. So um, I'm the only blonde child in my family. If you look at my sibling group, there's five of us. Uh, we're, we're a blended family. So my dad's uh, from, from the States. He's black. My mom's white. So two of my siblings are black. Two of them are brunettes and I'm the only blonde one. Uh, yes, let's blame free love and the, the way that they, they rolled in, in their sort of hippie driven commune sort of setting. Um, so I didn't go to school as a kid. So as much as I introed myself as, hey, I've got a master's degree and all this stuff, like my start couldn't have been more different. I'm particularly proud of that because of the struggle that it took me Mm. to get to those points. So I grew up in India, Brazil, Kenya, Russia, you know, France, Switzerland, all over Europe. I'm originally from Holland, in case you couldn't tell by my confused accent. Um, And there were some really good bits. So people think like, oh, my God, what was that like? But there were there were great bits. I'm so close to my sibling group. Uh, I always remember sort of music and laughter and singing. But over time, not going to school like this is this is the dark side. So we were basically being prepared to save the world. We were the unique generation. They were Armageddonists. They were thinking the end of the world was going to come. So imagine what that does to your nervous system when you're five six, seven. And, you know, we would leave houses overnight and just leave everything because, um, you know, the authorities were thinking the kids weren't safe or that, that, you know, uh, it wasn't a safe environment to be brought up in, you know, all sorts of things that meant I just moved constantly. You you sort of, this world of uncertainty, like that's sort of how I grew up, which was you were always going to, um, to, you know, be be moved, things were going to change that were outside of your control. Yeah. Now, interestingly, my mental health took the nosedive uh, and really spiraled out once I found the courage and left the, the commune setting. Um, I say find the courage. I was, uh, you know, I didn't really. I, I got pregnant with somebody who was outside of the commune. So I sort of got really good at leading a double life. Um, 
So I, on the one hand, I was actually rising up in the ranks of the, of the commune setting and was trusted in many ways. And on the other hand, I was living this hedonistic life of alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, anything to escape who I was and facing up to myself. Fell pregnant, moved to London with my boyfriend, and that was my sort of get out clause. That was my like, all right, let me give my, my son, who's now uh, almost 18, uh, a, a different chance at life. Um, but what happened was I tried so hard to be normal. I thought everyone else in the world was normal. I've since discovered other things. Um, but, but I just thought, okay, if I just mimic other people's behavior, then I'm going to be okay, right? Um, but imagine you're, my, my, I've grown up in communes with people everywhere. My boyfriend goes off to work uh, like a normal person. He has a job and I'm home with this kid with no people experiencing the loneliness that I've never experienced before, this isolation, this invisibility, but also a fundamental lack of purpose yeah. because, because we grew up with a collective purpose as, as wrong or whatever it might have been. It was still very focused. You always had a mission and we're going in a particular direction. Um, and so this is where my journey of depression, alcohol addiction, I then had two kids um, and spun out into, you know, the, an alcoholic woman or parent or mother, the, the amount of judgment, the amount of shame around that is, is huge and hit uh, several rock bottom points uh, and then had to make a decision to build my life. So there was a pivotal moment where I remember waking up and I just wanted the day to end before it had even begun. I was just like, I've, this is it. I've had it. I'm spent. I can't do anything else. I've been putting myself in danger. I've been putting my kids in danger and essentially convinced myself they would be better off without me. Right. Uh, and so what happened was I got this thought and uh, I gave myself a year's deadline to take my life. I didn't tell anyone about it, but on the inside, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And so for some reason, having that like get out clause mentally meant that I started experimenting with all the things that could make me happy, well, mentally healthy, because I had nothing left to lose. And of course that year came and went and life wasn't perfect, um, but I realized that I could teach myself to be happy. And so that sort of began the quest of teaching myself in many ways, learning about it. I then trained as a counselor. I then did a master's degree while, while sort of raising two kids and working full time. Like it was almost like the amount of energy that I went, that I spent in being a, an alcoholic and being um, unwell that much energy, you're super driven. And so I see this in you, you know what I mean? It's yep. like, if we, can you, if we can just refocus that amount of energy that we yeah. spend in a spiral of doom into good, I mean, my career has just taken off and so many things ha have happened. That's the short version, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just as far as, I guess, um, where I started from. And then yeah. I guess my mission in life is helping people understand what, we, what I call the messy middle. Yeah. So we love the inspirational stories of it was tough and now it's great, right? Yeah. Yay. But as you know, it's those daily decisions every single day that actually move us into a different place. Wow. Uh, yeah, where do we where do we start with all of these stories? It's, it's incredible, though. What a, what an incredible journey! And and you know, the, the 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 brief sort of overview that you've given to it is such an incredible inspirational thought already. Um, I do want to go to those middle parts though, because that's the piece, isn't it? That's the how do you go from feeling really low and you know putting this timeline to your life to to then coming through the other side of that? And 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 what was your what was your thought in the day that that happened? How was that really transpiring and translating into your mind mind at that point? Can you give us more sort of insights into that world? Yeah, and I, I feel like the thought was a little seed of a thought and it okay. wasn't a perfect plan, right? Yep. But what it meant was I somehow made a decision to look for the things and try the things. And right. so for me, the first step was to quit drinking. And okay. so while I don't go to AA anymore, I certainly did for the first few years. And it acted as um, a safe place to start telling my story. Okay. If I look back on what was the thing that actually helped me move forward, it was to start getting honest with myself about my story in with witnesses. And that's yeah. what counseling can do. That's what uh, talking to a friend can do a whole host of things. Because at the first when I went to AA, I would just sit there and listen. Yeah. And the, I would just hear stories that were more awful or just as awful as things that I had done 
total mm. shame, but people were sitting in acceptance and going, hey, this is what where my addiction or my mental health issues have taken me. So I had to observe that. And then I remember the first times I would share was like a minute, 30 seconds. I'd be a mess. I'd be weeping. I, my face was red. I was like, I would sit like this. You know, I would let, just try and be as invisible as possible, which is hilarious now that I speak on stages. Um, so it was learning, it was quitting drinking, which for me is a depressant. So for me, that is a very pivotal link to poor mental health. Yep. Um, and then it was being able to sit with myself, you know, because I, when, you, when you're not numbing out anymore, you then have to wake up to your part in certain things. And so I started learning how to take responsibility for myself. And that started with a three, I used to listen to this three minute guided meditation wow. when my, my nervous system was going and I would go for a walk and listen to this one three minute guided meditation over and over, like that was it. That was like, if I won the day and didn't drink and listen to that, that was a win, right? Yeah. Um, and then over time, um, I started volunteering. And I know that sounds like, oh, I, I wanna say crazy, but I know we're not always meant to use that word, but it sounds like, is that the right thing to do? Like, you're not well, are you giving back? Yeah. And I thought, no, there's something amazing about giving that allows you to, to feel purposeful and improves your mental health. So I went down to a youth center over in Peckham, which is near where I, and I just said, hey, do you need any volunteers? Which was scary for me, but yeah. I knew that working with young people was something that interested me. So I would, I would volunteer one day a week. So this is like the stacking effect yeah. of, you know, and at first I'd be like, what am I even doing here? Right. I didn't feel purposeful. And over time it did. And then learning, it's really the five ways to well-being, right? Yep. Learning, giving back, you know, yep. all of those things, connection, yep. um, that being active. So whether that was walking, whatever that was, it was, it's almost textbook doing yep. those things slowly yep. stacked up and then allowed. And then I got coaching and, you know, a whole host of things to then help me set goals and, and move forward, but small steps, tiny ones. Yeah, it is. It's so true though, isn't it? And the volunteering thing, I find a fascinating thought because I, I reflect back on when I started volunteering and, and I did it too early. That's why I always say, and I'm very honest about that now because I never addressed my own challenges because I thought, oh, I'm just going to go and help these other people. And and it is the old analogy of the, the, the mask on the airplane stuff, right? And I just yeah. didn't see it. And it took a long time to realize that actually what I was doing was was the wrong approach. So so how did you balance that at that point, especially when you're first sort of stepping into volunteering? Did you overcommit to the volunteering or did you find it was easy to sort of have that uh, boundary i mean it was i wasn't really responsible for anyone one-to-one -one, so i wasn't mentoring okay. or anything i was yep. at a youth center and i was just they were doing activities and i would just help them do the activities and i would chat to them here and there okay. um sort of ad hoc one evening a week so i actually think it was the perfect step that i needed to because we have to get out of our own head yep. you know and I find that we can get so sucked into the doom and gloom and what's wrong. For me, I, it was a victim mentality. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school. My parents messed up. What if you were in this situation? Now I had a kid, like my life was over. Like there was yeah. nothing, you know, that narrative. And so I had to f put myself in a situation that was outside of my own head. Yeah. And it, but again, I wasn't, you know, later on I would mentor and I would do things that were a bit more responsible within that, that state. And, and perhaps that might've been too soon. Um, yeah. But I think I, for me, it, were, it, it was definitely part of the stepping stone of getting out of my headspace. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Well, thank you for sharing that as well. So relationships around that time, how, how did that happen? Oh. What was going on? <laughs> oh, that was, a, that was a noise I wasn't <laughs> expecting or anticipating. <laughs> uh, but how were relationships around them when you were going through this transformation? Well, so I was with my, he's now my ex-husband, but I was with the father yeah. of my, my children. Yeah. Um, you know, arguably we were very different people. Our relationship foundation was based on partying right and then yeah. I got pregnant really quickly and then we were now playing house but neither of us were fully grown adults if you know what I mean so sure, yeah. it was it was tough it wasn't necessarily healthy especially at the beginning before I you know quit drinking there was lots of toxicity lots of um, partying while being responsible for kids like things that in hindsight just were not healthy ways of doing yeah. anything I definitely isolated myself. So anybody from my past, which would have been my support network, my family, my siblings, people from the, the communes, even if they'd left, 
I shut all of them out. Right. Partly because of the shame of where I'd got to, but partly because I needed to figure out my own head and I wanted to get away from influences. But again, this, this added to the feeling of isolation and loneliness, right? right. Um, and so over time, it was AA and then starting to study one day a week. Th these were my first sort of forays into friendships okay. and people who could actually see me and begin to build trust. Um, and I guess my, my noise was more about like the relationships now, like because I've got PTSD and I experience um, sort of threads of trauma from the past, even now, um, it's interesting that the healing journey has really been with my boyfriend of two years, which is showing up and um, in a different way again, and trying to navigate probably the first healthy relationship that I've that, that I've experienced so that's a whole podcast in itself Matt is <laughs> sorry well I don't need to touch on that just for a moment you know <laughs> of course you for, for indulging us for a moment on that but no that's really interesting and and what I want to bring towards now is 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 this where you are right now because obviously it's a different place you're in at the moment and what you do is incredible and and I know you share a lot of this content and you share your own real experiences of the, the of the right now as well isn't it so 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 talk about Petra today and what's, you know, what makes you happy and healthy and well and everything else that goes with it? So I'm, I feel grateful and privileged every day okay. to, to look at my two teenagers. Okay. So I just went, as I said, I took some time off last week and I spent some time in Bournemouth. And the most magical evening was my almost 18 year old son. We went for a walk at night and he, he was going to go for a walk on the beach. And I said, I'm going to go. Do you want to have some alone time? Because he's quite independent like that. And he went, no, let's walk together. And he gave me one of his ear pods to listen to his music. And we walked down to the beach together and we sat. And he's such a lesson in mindfulness, in intelligence, in being present with himself. And just so like he sent me, he gave me this card. I actually recently put it on social, if he's watching, um, right. where he thanked me for choosing to exist and uh, among other things. And we both knew what that meant, right? right? that he could have, that, that our paths could have been extremely different, right? Where um, he could have lost me. I could have made a different decision. Yeah. And so I'm privileged every day to, to look at him and my daughter who's 15 and just see who they are because yeah. me doing the work has made that possible, right? And they're just such beautiful humans. Um, but other than that, I think it's the mission to support people to take responsibility for their own mental health. And I still think in the world now, there's this fine line between this medicalization and even in the mental health space, this like, oh, you've got depression, that's so tough. Let me hold space and just sit with you. Yeah. And there's a place for that. And I think people who are experiencing poor mental health, there are small things that they can do, that we can do as well. I have to work on my addictions every day. I have to work on my PTSD triggers. I have, you know, um, and so I guess that's part of my message is like, what are the small things, no matter what label you have or what is going on for you that can give you autonomy over your own mental health journey? Um, and so I, I said earlier, so I've got a, I've got a team and, you know, so many things yeah. are happening now uh, at the moment. So, so taking that step forward from that piece around the team, CEO of your own company. Ooh. You know, and, and a company that's named after you as well. I know. There you go. <laughs> Amazing, right? You are a limited business. Um, the reality of being the CEO now, having that responsibility. So not only do you have two teenage children, you also have responsibilities as a as an owner of a business. How do you find that, and how do you support your team as the best you can? What a journey it's been. I think the main lesson is vulnerability as a leader. Yeah. I'm very honest about what I get wrong or what I don't know. Um, and I'm sh and and I think we've created what we call psychological safety. So what we teach okay. other people to do, and part and most of and we're remote. So a lot of us of them were hired within a remote setting. We're we're continue. You know, our COOs in New York. We've got someone in Scotland. We've got uh, you know people spread around, creating space and time for the. And it's not just these like oh let's have a quiz or a tea morning or whatever people do. Yeah. It's like, we'll be in a team meeting and people will cry or if, we'll, we're not right. afraid of emotion. We're like okay. so honest about what is going on for you. And especially in the pandemic. 
And yeah. so everybody's had a story and something going on and we create space to hold that, right? And I'm, and I, and as a leader, I have to start. So I can't, as you know this, I can't say, so guys, tell me about your personal life. How are you doing? If I'm not gonna go there myself. So I've got to go, it was a tough week. It's so hard to do this, this, and this, or these are my challenges. What's yeah. going on for you? But what's interesting, and this is the balance that we're trying to codify is, um, how is that still uplifting? So we can go to dark places together and be there together, but we are so uplifting and accountable to each other. So yeah. what do you need to get you through this week? How can we help? Those sorts of questions just to, to move people along. But I will say I'm learning every day. Um, I had to fire somebody that the first person I hired, I had to let them go. And yeah. it broke a bit of my heart because I, but it just wasn't the right match. It wasn't the right fit. And so learning that supporting your people doesn't mean being a pushover. And I think that's what people get the balance a little bit. You know, we can be direct and empathetic. We can be purposeful and hold vision and be clear and be kind, right? So it's always holding that. And then, you know, we've just done a leadership survey. I'm about to get results from all the team who commented on my leadership uh, style. And we're going to yep. have a team meeting to discuss that openly together. I'm scared. Yep but that's, okay. that's yeah funny. yeah <laughs> well, you're scared why are you scared are you scared you should know people though right <laughs> i know well do what are the dark parts of the shadow parts of myself that i still don't know or right. that i think because i've had moments where my ptsd sometimes shows up in snappy behavior or like okay. um suddenly being a bit scared and taking it out on other people and I remember we had a meeting where that exact thing happened and I had to circle back and go, guys, I, I was triggered. My PTSD went off and that what, that's not who I want to be. Yeah. Right. So I think I do think that's what leadership, good leadership is, is always showing up and saying, hey, I might have gotten it wrong. But um, hey, it's still just because I'm, I've done it for a while doesn't mean it's not scary to, to go. All right, guys, here's the feedback everyone gave me anonymously. Yeah. These are my strengths and weaknesses. Let's let's talk. How can I be better? Right. And that and that I think that's a, that's a wonderful trait to have, though, isn't it? You've got that self-reflective element of I can see when maybe my PTSD was triggered or maybe I've done something wrong and I can sort of accept that and say, you know what? Hands up. I'm not you know, we're not we're not all born leaders and managers and everything else. We just have to try. Sometimes we stumble through it and we get we get mis we make mistakes, don't we? And it's accepting that that's true. But but that feedback it's going to be well, it's interesting to see how how that feels after you've had that. Um, yeah, when, when I, you, I would say that when am I doing this? Yeah, I think, when, the, de I think the deadline is in a week for people right, to complete okay. it and then we'll probably do it the, the week after. Yeah, yeah. Probably the other biggest or hardest lesson from being an independent consultant has been letting go yeah. so trusting people to do the work to, to, it's a shift in a role to help yeah. people do the thing rather than you do all the things so yeah. that's been the other probably biggest learning journey for me and where do you see your business going what are you what are your plans petra to, you know tell us there, what do you want to yes. do with it? They're so, they're so big. They're so global. Oh, no. um, I think we've been working with some amazing companies and it's, yeah. you know, the work is not going to go away. It's overnight, even in the UK, there's still so far to go in, in sort of moving businesses to a really sustainable approach on this. But I really feel like they're, we're all on the same side. There's so much competition as it were, like people coming into this space. And I just think nobody can be you. Nobody can be me. We're all bringing a different angle and a different match to a workplace to support them on a part of their journey, right? So yeah, we have, we have big ambitions to, to grow, but to do it in a conscious way that the team and the culture is paramount. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I think you have to be really careful, don't we? We just don't overload or overman the services with, with people just because we have to have a purpose and a reason and you know I work with people today who you know I, I work with them because there is a specific element of what they do that I, I I want to engage with or I want to use or I want to support and and I think that's for me I, you say the word competition I, I don't really see competition so much in this in this area because I think if we're all having conversations about mental health that's a really positive thing and and if we're all encouraging change for the good and change for the good of course that's a really positive thing I, I guess the challenge we all have is you know these these sort of 
I don't know, experts or people that are passionate, let's say passionate about mental health, um, because I'd hate to refer to myself as an expert if I'm not. So it really is about how do we help the service and the support out there to improve? Because I think that's an area where I, for you know, first-hand experience, understand there are challenges. How do you feel about that side and that element? Because I know you mentioned working for an EAP originally as well, or, or previously. How do you feel I, about well, services? Uh, so when you say services, just clarify that for me. Do you, do you mean within a corporate setting or do you mean so, us as like other experts? No, I, so I'm sort of talking about just uh, services within the NHS today or within oh, the services oh, that companies offer because there's different elements, aren't there? They're very different. Got it. Well, so I think that? the whole EAP system needs to be disrupted. I okay. think it was set up for an, an old school environment and I think the world of work should be changing. It is, been, it is changing, but this, it, there's a new opportunity within the okay. pandemic for it to change. Part of it is it's an insurance model and I've seen the back end of like who gets support and who doesn't is based on what contract or agreement you have. Um, and I, find, I just don't find that it's about the patient or the client or the individual yeah. who needs support. It's not about the best for them. That's not to say that the counselors aren't great or the, the support isn't great, but often you have to call a helpline first. The whole um, education, the, the whole branding of it within an organization is like, when you're struggling, call yeah. this number. And you're like, all right, that's answering to the crisis end, which as you know, is this. Yep. And we want to just, what's the prevention space? How do we um, mitigate that crisis by creating you know, leaders who and managers who can create that space together? Yeah. Um, and that you can access it in a different way. So if you have to call a helpline and answer a whole bunch of questions from somebody who may not have that much empathy and has been doing a thousand of them a day, like, is that gonna, it takes so much courage to ask for help. You, you know what that's like, it, it yeah. takes so much courage. Yes. And if I'm now gonna get like an 18 year old call center person asking me like questions about where I live and stuff, I'm gonna be like, this doesn't feel confidential. And this, it took me so much courage to get here. Anyway, I know it's beneficial for some people, yep. but I do think it needs to be disrupted. And there are companies who are doing that. Um, there's a lot of tech for good. And I'm, if, if I'm um, in two minds about some of it because it's all about how it's used and is it sustainable? And in some cases, I don't think it is, uh, but in others it can be. Um, so it's so simple when it comes down to it. It's about human connection. Yep. It's so simple, right? And we complicate it. And it's just about how are you? What's going on for you, yeah. right? How am I? Like what's real and true? That's all it's about, you know? Um, and then supporting each other. What do you need? How can I help? Like yeah. that's a movement for change. That's what I want to create in businesses. Brilliant. Oh, I love it. And I'm 100% committed to the same objective. I think it's, it is, you know, we talk human to human. We like this thing B to B, B to C. And I'm like, well, why can't we have H to H? You know, it's human to human. Everything we do is a transaction between you and I. You know, it's between you as a human, me as a human. And we have to learn to understand a little bit more about the human element to it. Right. So, so important. So thank you for sharing your your thoughts and words there as well. We are coming to the end of this recording. Oh, my God, this is just like disappeared before our very eyes. Um, I'm just going to throw it over to you, Petra, just so final thoughts, any words of wisdom that you want to share with anybody um, over to you. Sure. Well, first of all, I know a lot of people are struggling. I've had yeah. some times during the, the pandemic that I've, I've been surprised at a low mood or at a crash point. And I'm the most opti optimistic person I know. So, of course, people are struggling. So um, keep going. I love the AA uh, um, line that says just for today. I used to live by that just for today. Show up, talk to somebody, look at the five ways to well-being, do something for you. Uh, and of course, can I say where people can find us as well? Yeah, of course, yeah. please do. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, right um, so our website, we're about to do a rebrand. It's, it's launching in September. Awesome. It's very exciting. I'm so excited. Uh, it's just my name, petravelzabor.com. Uh, but follow me on LinkedIn. That's probably the place where I put the most like workplace mental health content. Uh, just my name again and connect and see if we can support you in any way. 
Brilliant stuff. Well, I will also drop the links when I put this out there so people will be able to see how or know how to find you and connect with you. Um, Petra, it's just been lovely listening to you talking about your experiences and of course sharing and thank you for sharing uh, the experiences, the journey that you've been through and also the work that you're doing in this space. It is amazing work that you are doing. You are helping so many people and you're absolutely right. You know, people are struggling. They are, you know, this is a reality. Let's just check that reality and say, if you are struggling, never feel that you're on your own please don't there are always people out there that do care there are many organizations that can support you can help you and they're waiting you know to listen to your stories if you need to talk about anything um we're all going through challenges there are different things in our lives and you know that's that's a moment when we should have the ability to talk openly about you know what things aren't so great at the moment so thank you Petra for telling us all about the permission to talk about these things and I just loved our conversation um if anybody is struggling that's listening please know Samaritans uh, exist today to help support some of these conversations of course there are many other organizations you can call Samaritans for free on 116123 or you can text to uh, shout at 85258 if you prefer to text somebody rather than talk um but don't feel that you're on your own with those thoughts especially when they're not easy ones to to manage through Petra, it's been an absolute pleasure. I knew it would be anyway, so it's no big surprise. I um, just want to wish you all the very best for everything. Take care of yourself, look after yourself, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.